very good evening to all of you with the blessings of honorable founder president sir dr ashok ke chauhan honorable chancellor sir dr atul chauhan honorable vice chancellor ma'am dr balwinder sukla on behalf of cancer biology cluster amity university i welcome you all in the sixth cancer uh, biology cluster webinar series in today's webinar we have a great scientist the great mentor great researchers dr daddy wells and a great human being who has devoted his whole life and he has fighted a lot to uh, uh, funding agencies to to fund for the metastasis cancer and we also have uh, our panel members dr bisidas sir he is a dean of health and allied sciences he is also chairman of amity institute of molecular medicine and stem cell research he is a founder director of uh national cancer prevention center india icmr institute which is in noida we also have ku med alumni three alumni ku med alumni are here in this presentation it's a great day today for us we have a dean of biotechnology and biosciences dr chandradeep tandon sir here and dr professor simran tandon ma'am here as a panelist so with this before i introduce in detail uh, today's speaker may i kindly request our dean dr bc das sir to give introductory remarks uh, good evening to one and all and uh, thanks dr uh, dhruv for the kind words and uh, the introductory words and um, at the outset i would um, uh, on behalf of our honorable founder president who is our uh, president of amity universe we call it universe because there are more than 11 universities in the country and 17 campuses abroad including a huge campus of 175 acre um, the the new island uh, the uh, campus which is um, uh, uh, long island campus in new york which is just near to the uh, the great lab that what is it called and i have forgotten that uh, this uh, old spring the, old spring i will just remember and tell and then Cold Spring Herbal Laboratory. Yes, so Herbal. it is nearer. Uh, next is a uh, Cold Spring Herbal Laboratory. So, um, so this is a great. Um, uh, it is coming up as a uh, the, the, the the hub, the international research and innovation hub, in there. So that is a Amity campus is coming up to mainly with the aim of building up a the uh, international hub for the research and innovation. and he is a great visionary dr ashok k chauhan and our honorable um, dynamic most dynamic chancellor dr atul chauhan and our vice chancellor um, professor dr balwinder sukra and also our amity family all the amity family and on behalf of the um, also the uh, the cancer clusters i welcome and all the uh, amity family on behalf of them and on my own behalf i welcome uh, professor dr danny r wells from university of kansas medical center kumc it is very commonly known i know there are panelists from the kumc those who have spent a uh, few years there they are post doctoral and the uh, scientist position there but i have also visited there two three days i have delivered lecture there so i know the campus so it's a huge campus and excellent medical center particularly famous for the cancer research so yeah, the the today's speaker 
Um, Professor Wells comes from that medical center. He is the chair of the uh, medical center department of cancer biology, University Cancer Center under the, uh, the KUMC, Kansas Medical Center. And uh, he has made uh, um, outstanding contributions in cancer research, particularly in the cancer metastasis. So he will speak what is all he has done. And uh, I think he has more than 250 publications and many other projects and uh, the huge contributions he has made in this field of cancer research, basically in the breast cancer and triple negative breast cancer, which is also, you will be surprised to know Professor Wells that in India, we have reported that the, um, the prevalence of the triple negative breast cancer is the highest in premenopausal women below 35 years of age. It is more than 74%. So you can imagine the, uh, the, the, the extent of the problem now coming up. I know in US, the uh, this breast cancer is mostly including triple negative breast cancer. They are on postmenopausal, but some are premenopausal too, but then here majoritily, either it is triple negative or other cancers, they start from 22 years and worse, and they are below uh, 35 years and or 40 years, and they are uh, all premenopausal stages. So this is a biology is a little different here. That is very interesting to study, and we are looking at it. Uh, here at Amity um, uh, University, which is one of the 11 universities in the country, I told, and the 17 campuses abroad, including the biggest campus in the um, uh, Long Island campus. And, and uh, this, um, we at Amity Institute, uh, this uh, AMSAR, we have a Amity Institute of Molecular Medicine or um, uh, stem cell research, which I chair as a chairperson. And then it has one of the big group of the cancer biologists. Though there are other departments also have cancer biologists, but this is a group working on um, the, more out of 15 faculty, we have 12 in the, the cancer biology coming from all and uh, covering all major cancers that are highly prevalent in India, including cancer cervix, breast, ovarian, liver, and head and neck, and highly aggressive cancer such as uh, the pancreatic cancer. And uh, we run also three specialty courses, which is first time in India we have introduced that the uh, MSc in cancer biology, we call cellular and molecular oncology, uh, CMO, and it is now, uh, name is now changed to the molecular cancer biology, then uh, stem cell and uh, regenerative medicine, and then molecular medicine. So these are, there are other courses, but I will not go into that, but these are the few um, uh, frontier courses being run here, and also along with that PhD programs. So we have around 45 to 50 students doing PhD in this department. But this campus, the Amity University of today's AUUP, we have more than 40,000 students in this campus, but you will find now it is open just more than a week now it is open, but there's only final year students are coming here, but then now uh, it is 45, uh, 40 to 40,000, 45,000 students in this campus. And plus the other research to other people, including it is almost uh, uh, one lakh means uh, uh, 10 million people comes in the, every day in the campus. So, uh, 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 so uh, one lakh means it is 0.1 million rather. I'm, I'm sorry to uh, 1 million people, 0.1 million people comes in the campus every day. So, but then because of the COVID, it is less populations are coming. So I will not take much time. So uh, with this brief introduction, I once again welcome you to this Amity University, which is one of the best universities in this, uh, in, in the country, in the private university, but it's uh, one of the, it is famous for his research and innovation, and it is one of the top private university. So thank you very much for making your, uh, making it convenient to uh, accept our invitation and for the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for your uh, kind words and introductory remarks. 
uh, just I, I got a call from Dr. Salvamurti, sir, and mm -hmm. sir is joining in uh, a few seconds now. Okay. So uh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, just wait for her, uh, his... Um, he will, he will he will introduce that and he will start introduction okay okay, so okay. He, he will, when he will come after introduction he can yes 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 yes, yes. i'm going to i'm going to do uh, just i'm going to complete that not, not yes, yes, yes yes complete the introduction yes sir yes sir yes sir yeah so um, it is a really great pleasure uh, for us for all of us to uh, uh, having uh, Dr. Danny Wells here today in this cancer cluster webinar series. And uh, if I go through his CV, it's 81 page long CV, it may take hours to uh, read and introduce Dr. Wells. In a simple way, if I introduce Dr. Wells, I would say that he is a man of metastasis. If you talk about metastasis and you do not talk about Dr. Danny Wells, then it is not complete. He is the man who has started the work on cancer metastasis. Earlier, people were talking about tumor growth, tumor progression. Okay, but not not you know too much focused uh, for people were giving uh, uh, on cancer growth not on the metastasis. So Dr. Wells started this work long back, cancer metastasis, to work on a cancer metastasis. And he has discovered several genes related to uh, metastasis. The first time he has introduced metastasis suppressor, we all know tumor suppression, but there are several metastasis suppressor and the first time he has introduced that. He has invented, he might be uh, talking about some of uh, the genes that he has discovered and like a kiss one. It's a very funny, it looks very funny, kiss one and a prince one. These are some of the famous uh, invention that Dr. Wells has uh, uh, made. And the interesting thing, he is the first student of Nicholson. Doctor, we all study in a test book, we have a study and we teach even to the students, Singer and Nicholson, <clears throat> who has given the model, fluid mosaic model. We all study in the membrane. So he is the first PhD student of Nicholson, Dr. Nicholson. And Dr. Wells has published more than 300 research articles in a top medical, uh, uh, the cancer research journals including cancer research, clinical cancer research, gastroenterology, etc. many more journals and book chapters and books. Dr. Wells is an excellent mentor. He is also, he's a mentor of my mentor. He is mentoring Dr. Supi Thomas as, at KU Medical Center. She's my mentor. And he has also mentored me when I was there. And during his period, I received the, my first research grant that was from NIH, that K. Embryo research grant I received for one year. And uh, there, uh, Dr. Wells has provided me huge support, the mentorship. If you talk to uh, the grant mentoring or the, in the review committee, there is not even a single review committee is in NIH that do not put Dr. Wells as a review expert. So all metastasis, grant review committee related to a metastasis by NIH and other funding agencies, Dr. Wells is there. He's a great, great human being, a great mentor. And he's a founder that he has made and there is a cancer biology course uh, uh, run by KU Med for uh, research as well as for masters. He's, he also played important role in bringing comprehensive cancer center. That is the KU Med Center, the KU Cancer Center is now comprehensive cancer center. So he played great role, very important role in bringing that application 
and that uh, uh, value to the KU Med. So with this, I would like to welcome and invite Dr. Danny Wells to share his thoughts and views on cancer metastasis. One more thing, we are celebrating International Women's Week. And uh, so on this uh, occasion, it's a really great day today that Dr. Wells will be discussing some of the, uh, you know, his lecture, his parts, how breast cancer, how these genes, how these metastases are associated with the breast cancer as well. That's a great. So thank you. Thank you. To, uh, uh, so with this, I would like to welcome Dr. Danny Wells to share his thoughts and research. So sir, it's, it's over to you now. Thank you so much, Drew. Uh, I don't know <clears throat> that I uh, deserve that uh, very, very generous introduction. Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Das, Dr. Tandon, and, and you for the invitation and for being here. And I look forward to uh, your feedback. Um, and I will just dive in. Uh, so with that, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how mitochondria play a role in cancer metastasis. Um, our, just uh, so that you are aware that uh, we hold a patent, so there may be a bit of conflict, but there's nothing that uh, I will talk about that uh, works with uh, patient material today. Uh, my tradition is to acknowledge the people who have contributed to the work um, and uh, as you can see, just for this project, this is a large group, uh, the, and uh, I'll try and uh, say what people do during my talk, but uh, I also want to uh, highlight these people on the right side. These are patients and uh, advocates in this country who uh, are very supportive of our work, and, and that is the goal that we have, is to help uh, these, these patients. So very quickly, um, I'm going to present a fairly large amount of data um, talking about mitochondrial roles in metastasis and how they are both intrinsic within the cancer cell and extrinsic um, within the host and how those uh, mechanisms may play a role. Um, and then uh, towards the end, it'll be a bit more speculation, um, a lot of unpublished data, talking about how mitochondria regulate the process and the potential mechanisms. And, and uh, end with just a few of the challenges associated with this new line of investigation. Uh, just by way of background, uh, Drew uh, illustrated it, and then this is a cancer cluster. Uh, so you know about metastasis, but uh, just a reminder, this is responsible for in excess of 90% of morbidity and mortality. Um, it involves lots of different steps, and each step involves a lot of molecules and genes. Fortunately, it's a very inefficient process, and um, that requires coordination of a bunch of things. In 2019, Doug Hurst and I put forth the idea that there are four hallmarks of metastasis, that is characteristics that are present in every metastatic cell, the ability to uh, move around, uh, the ability to adapt or plasticity, to modulate the environment and then eventually grow at a secondary site. So we know it's a big problem. And from a clinical perspective, there's, there are a few questions that, that arise. Why is it that two people who look essentially identical with regard to risk factors, they develop such different types of cancer? And this relates to what Dr. Das was saying about the triple negative and premenopausal patients in India. And maybe this will address some of that. Why is it two patients who have the same cancer, same stage and so on, will experience different side effects or um, responses to therapy? And those are the questions we're trying to answer right now in the lab. But the first person who really tackled this is my friend Kent Hunter at the National Cancer Institute. And what Kent did is he took a transgenic mouse 
um, driven uh, by the mammary tumor virus promoter and the polyoma middle T antigen that develops uh, um, estrogen receptor positive cancers. He crossed these with 60 other strains of mice and identified that depending upon the genetic background of those mice, he would see different efficiencies of metastasis. He's then used genetic uh, models to map at least 20 um, genes that modify the efficiency of metastasis. And so he's been very successful in showing that the background genetics are critical. But um, the, of these uh, many, many genes, we questioned whether there might be other quantitative trait loci or QTLs that he may have overlooked. Because when he did this experiment, the transgenic mouse was crossed uh, and, and using the uh, um, inheritance from mother and father, um, he, that's how he's mapped these. However, what most people didn't recognize is that those 60 strains of mice were always female. And since we inherit mitochondria only from our mothers or almost exclusively from our mothers, it leads us to the hypothesis that polymorphisms in mitochondria contribute to metastatic efficiency or inefficiency. And uh, our goal has been, been to test that. Very quickly, a little bit of background, and this is where I will try and weave a couple of stories together. Mitochondria are uh, generally well-known for their ability to generate energy. Um, it's maternally inherited, and we have hundreds of thousands of mitochondria in each cell. And each mitochondrion contains multiple copies of circular DNA or mitochondrial DNA. But these, the mitochondrial genome accounts for only 37 genes. And we'll come back to that point in a little bit. But importantly, uh, it will play a role that mitochondria define our ancestry or uh, in, in simpler terms, race or our clade in evolution. So as humans migrated out of Africa, towards Europe and Asia, um, the, the mutations that it, uh, developed were selected for um, different traits. So in Africa, you want the energy converted so that you can run quick and catch a gazelle for dinner. But in Sweden, uh, you want some of that energy converted to heat. So the mitochondria have, uh, have been selected uh, to help different ancestries. Um, in, with regard to energy. My postdocs, TJ Beadnell and Adam Scheid um, have done some very nice detailed reviews and mitochondria do have roles in, in various cancer, but their roles have been mostly overlooked, but copy number variants and mutations uh, vary greatly by cancer type um, and, and which complexes are involved in uh, electron transport that are uh, looked at. Again, uh, they exist in different ancestries or, or clades. And these uh, changes we think are, are overlooked and will be important in determining the aggressiveness of the cancers. So um, how would we then take this background, which I went through very quickly and approach studying the role of mitochondria um, there have been a lot of studies, you saw them in the previous couple of slides, looking at genome-wide um, or epigenome-wide associations and to develop correlations with mitochondrial mutations in cancer. There are limitations to those data, though. When doing whole genome sequencing, almost every lab throws out mitochondrial sequences. And what most people don't realize is that within the nuclear genome, there have been integrations of mitochondrial DNA. So there are lookalikes for the mitochondrial genome inside the nuclear genome. And that complicates interpretation with short read sequences. We wanted to focus on looking at function, uh, developing appropriate models that would allow this. 
Um, but those to develop those models where we could isolate mitochondrial genetics required uh, historically introduction of mutations by treating cells for years or months with uh, ethidium bromide, for example, to get rid of mitochondrial DNA and then uh, introduce it. The problem is those mutagens also mutated nuclear DNA and would cause problems. So to overcome this, we made a new type of genetically engineered mouse. We call it the mitochondrial nuclear exchange or minx mouse. And in essence, we used a standard needle that's used for making transgenic mice. And we removed the nucleus from a cell, leaving the cytoplasm intact. And we took the nucleus from another cell and we basically swapped them out. So now we have a, a nuclear genome that's paired with a different mitochondrial genome. And when we did this in, in fertilized eggs and transplanted them into pseudopregnant females, we've developed these mouse colonies. <clears throat> and uh, we have, I'm showing you shorthand nomenclature. The first letter will be the nuclear genome. The second letter is the mitochondrial genome. C57 is C, C3H will be H, and FVB um, strain is F. Um, so hopefully it'll be fa fairly easy to remember, but I'll try and remind you of, of that as we go through. And we replicated the Kent Hunter experiment. The polyoma middle T mouse is on the FVB background. So we use these bottom three uh, minx mice so we crossed with the nuclear genome that's identical. So we don't have polymorphisms in the nuclear genes that Kent Hunters used. We only changed the mitochondrial genome. And um, I'll show, this is just a quick summary, but here we're looking at latency for the primary tumor development. And uh, here's the cross with the wild type. And the red lines are our means. And the stars off to the side are the data from the Hunter lab. Our data superimposed, and the only variable we changed was the mitochondrial genome. As Kent showed, uh, we saw a decrease in the size of the metastases with C57 black 6, an increase in the size with the BALB C, and the size of the METS was identical for the FBB. So, Changing one variable that he did not change, the, uh, the mitochondrial genome, uh, we uh, showed that mitochondria do play a role. Amanda Brinker, uh, who was a postdoc or a grad student in the lab, uh, extended these studies using HER2 as our oncogene and showed, in fact, that uh, the mitochondrial genome would affect uh, development of tumors there. And Carol and Vivian uh, just looked at these mice as we allowed them to age for their spontaneous tumor development. And in every case, we saw that the mitochondrial genome was affecting tumor development and metastasis. But mo really critically, there's an interaction between the mitochondrial genome and the nuclear driver, the oncogene that's driving the tumor. So I happen to be presenting this to Bill Dove, who developed the uh, APC or the MIM mouse. Um, and he's a wonderful geneticist. And he, he asked me if we had an artifact um, of some long lived factor in the cytoplasm. And I, I argued uh, that it was not that because we were using mice that were 10 generations out uh, from when we developed them and the thought of something surviving that long seemed a bit too, too low probability. But the way we decided to test it is we took male minx mice and crossed them with the uh, transgenic mice. And fortunately, uh, we showed that there was no significant difference in, in those mice. So it is not an experimental artifact. It does appear to be inheritance of the nuclear, I'm sorry, the mitochondrial genome. So 
while I hope that quick summary of uh, several papers uh, convinces you that the mitochondrial genome is critical in controlling metastasis, it, some things just don't add up. Um, and that is metastasis has been known for many years to involve coordinated expression of adhesion genes, uh, proteases, uh, proliferation molecules and the like. And the mitochondria genome is just way too small to accomplish this on its own. 37 genes, it's only 16 KB in size for both the mouse and the human. So we had to come up with a new hypothesis. And that is that maybe somehow the mitochondrial genome is regulating the nuclear gene transcriptome or gene expression by influencing the nuclear um, epigenome. Um, so we decided to, to test this in the minx mice. And we did this in collaboration uh, with Badur Salhia, who's on the right, um, with Carolyn Vivian and John McGuire, who were in the lab. And we isolated, in this case, I'll show you data from brain, and we did whole epigenome analysis. And while I know this is hard to see and read, um, the, it's published, so I, that's why I'm just showing it in this smaller form. We showed that this polymorphisms in the mitochondria selectively alter the epigenome by um, using uh, the methylation status or histone marks using chromatin immunoprecipitation to modify which genes are expressed. And we measured that with RNA-seq and Affymetrix arrays. So we've moved with the technology. The critical part here is we have a 100 to 200 genes that are selectively changed for their gene expression. Um, and uh, we, we know those map with particular polymorphisms. So the key word here is selectivity. So again, this, this would be, make sense that the mitochondria are interacting with the nuclear genome to change expression change intensity, and change a phenotype. So uh, it, I know it's evening in India, but it's, uh, I just uh, got up here in the United States. Um, and one of my favorite times of the day is when I'm showering to get ready to go come into work. And uh, often I'm just relaxed enough to think about things in a little uh, more calm way. And, uh, it occurred to me one morning uh, while in the shower that when we do these genetic crosses, it's not only the cancer cells that inherit these mitochondrial genes. It's every cell in the stroma, the endothelial cells, the fibroblasts and the like. So we asked whether the stroma in the minx mice affect metastatic potential. And to address this question, we chose four cell lines, two melanomas and two mammary carcinomas. And we had to choose these lines because they're syngeneic to the nuclear background. So we eliminated the immune kind of response, at least from a histocompatibility perspective. And we took these cells and we injected them into syngeneic mice that had different mitochondrial backgrounds, but nuclear backgrounds were identical. A lot of data on this slide, but the pink are the mammary, the black, B16 and K1735 are the melanoma. What we showed is that in every case, when the mitochondria are of C57 black six background, metastasis is inhibited by three to five fold. Whenever we have C3H mitochondria in the stroma, metastasis is promoted three to five fold. So this was kind of comforting in that we found it, but um, uncomfortable because we have no idea how this is possible. So uh, 
in my office, I have a whiteboard. It's about four feet by six feet. And we started putting uh, potential hypotheses to explain this. Um, a short list is here on the right, but we had 117 plausible hypotheses. Uh, and we decided to prioritize them and ask about them. And I'm just going to show you quickly some of this data where we looked at, at the ones that you see here. Um, one of the first questions we got asked, because mitochondrial content can change dramatically in cells, is if mitochondrial mass could be impacted. So we looked at uh, two mitochondrial genes. We normalized that to the nuclear genome and saw variability, but there was no statistical uh, correlation with metastasis. Obviously, everybody asks if, since mitochondria is so integral to metabolism, is there a change in metabolism uh, in these mink mice? And the answer is yes. You would expect that because the mitochondria are not the same. Um, these are happen to be data using a, uh, a, a method for measuring oxygen consumption and acidification and so on. Um, in the fibroblasts or epithelium. And again, there are differences, but they don't correlate with anything. Uh, we then began to look at uh, almost 6,000 metabolites. And uh, again, there are differences in the me uh, metabolite pools in these various tissues. Uh, and the minx mice are distinct, but most of the metabolism is driven by the nuclear genome as opposed to the mitochondrial genome, but they are both uh, integrated. Um, so we don't believe that metabolism is the critical element here, and I'll come back to that again in a couple of minutes. Um, mitochondria are known to be very genetically unstable because it's the highest concentration of reactive oxygen species inside cells. And so Takai Brewer, a fellow who worked in the lab for a while, uh, we did deep sequencing of the mitochondrial genome in normal primary tumor and metastases. And you can see that in fact, the tumor happened to have fewer mut mut mutants in it than the wild type for the FB mouse but the numbers of mutants went up in the, in the Mets um, and others like in the uh, FEB wild type, they would go down or remain pretty stable. So uh, instability didn't seem to be critical and transfer of mitochondrial DNA also did not take place. As mitochondria are metabolizing, they're creating um, a number of uh, um, metabolite pools that can go between cells. One of the most commonly recognized among these is butyrate that's uh, made in the, uh, it's been measured in the gut. And the butyrate can be taken up by other cells and alter the epigenome of other cells. Uh, because of the metabolites didn't appear to show this uh, effect in a consistent way, we uh, reduced the probability of this um, it, in our system, but we haven't excluded it yet. I mentioned that reactive oxygen species uh, are very high in mitochondria, and Amanda um, hypothesized that it's the reactive oxygen species that function as signaling molecules, uh, and this is an emerging field, but uh, um, it, it's, I think, well recognized in that way. And the design of our experiment is shown here on the, the right. We took mice and we treated them uh, one day before, and then an hour before we injected cancer cells into these mice. The half-life of this drug, Mitotempo, which is a superoxide dismutase II mimic, is only about an hour, but the, the effects can last for longer. And we quantified the metastases and uh, I will highlight just a couple of these key points. Um, C3H, we see lots of metastases 
as I showed you before, when we have C57 mitochondria, the number of metastases drops dramatically. Um, and uh, if we have uh, those same mice, we treat them with mitotempo, we've eliminated reactive oxygen species, not eliminated, reduced significantly reactive oxygen species. Uh, we measured that by mass spectrometry in collaboration with Sophia Lunt uh, using a method published by Michael Murphy's lab in the UK. When we reduce the reactive oxygen species, metastasis drops. On the right-hand side, we have our controls, C57. We have the C3H mitochondria, my, uh, number of metastases goes up. When we re, uh, eliminate or reduce the reactive oxygen species, the uh, level of metastasis drops. So this is consistent with the reactive oxygen species being helpful in promoting metastasis. But we cannot do the converse experiment where we induce reactive oxygen species because that is unethical. It, it causes major problems in the mice. So uh, while this is strongly suggestive, we can't fulfill all of Koch's postulates uh, with regard to answering this question. TJ Biednell, a postdoc in the lab, uh, took up the challenge of asking if the stroma is changing, is it the immune stroma? And I'm show, gonna show you two very small bits of data that um, uh, demonstrate that the immune system is, is relevant. Here, it's naive mice. These are just isolating the spleen and peritoneal washes from these mice, and we can show significant changes uh, of macrophages in the peritoneum, but not in the spleen, or T helper cells in the spleen, but not in the peritoneum. And uh, the, the key point here is the immune profiles in different tissues and in the, these mice vary uh, significantly. And the, the details are published uh, in a paper last year in the BBA, Molecular Basis of Disease. TJ then went on to isolate metastases, and we looked at um, recruited macrophages. And here's just a, a one example. Um, in the C3H wild-type mouse, we have very high levels of recruited macrophages in the metastases. But when you have the C57 mitochondria, the number of recruited macrophages drops dramatically. Um, or the number of dendritic cells increases dramatically. Um, and so it appears that there's some change in the myeloid population uh, that promotes metastasis when C3H mitochondria are present. And uh, looking at Jeff Pollard's uh, metastasis-associated macrophages, we can see a dramatic increase, <coughs> excuse me, in the number of those populations. And in fact, in the precursor cells that didn't quite reach statistical significance, but this is a precursor to the, the ones in the bottom. So um, this next slide is a bit um, dif different in terms of thinking. And I just ask for you to uh, walk with me through the logic of this. We were interested in the immune system, but uh, a lot of emerging data from the clinical cancer uh, literature, as well as some mouse models, show that microbiome, the bacterial um, uh, uh, population in the gut, would affect immune profiles. So we questioned whether the microbiome might be changing, but it was from a different perspective. It's been thought, um, and I think the data are strong, that mitochondria are in fact ancient bacteria that have evolved over time. Um, but as the cell was endos uh, endocytosed, uh, it, they became, the bacteria became eventually mitochondria by evolution. And we know that bacteria communicate with each other using mechanisms like quorum sensing. So we ask the question in a simple way, do mitochondria retain the ability to communicate with bacteria 
And do bacteria perhaps have the ability to communicate with their uh, mitochondrial or ancestors? If they do, with quorum sensing as a backdrop, mitochondria might influence bacterial growth and therefore affect the microbiome in a selective manner. Because we know that the microbiota are selective in humans, uh, they're primarily Firmicutes and Bacteriotides, but um, there are a number of other things. So Sharon Manley, TJ, myself, Adam Scheid, um, and several others, we collected mouse uh, feces and we did deep sequencing and we looked at the microbiota. And on the left, you'll see principal component analysis showing FVB, FVB with BALB-C mitochondria and FVB with C57 mitochondria. C57 and with C3H and C3H with C57 um, mitochondria. The principal component analyses show that the microbiome is distinct in the minx mice compared to the wild type. The volcano plots on the right um, compare wild type with uh, their minx counterparts, and the numbers in red boxes show you the specific bacterial species that were changed. And we are sorting through those different species to ask the question of uh, what, what, what those changes are. Um, but it's very clear that it's not a, a wholesale change in the microbiome, it's selected my, uh, microbial species. So we are actively pursuing that uh, in the lab right now. So I hope at least at this juncture, you are um, relatively convinced that mitochondria do in fact alter tumor formation and metastasis using both intrinsic and extrinsic mechanisms uh, that involve alteration of epigenetic marks in the cancer cells um, and in the stroma, immune profiles, reactive oxygen species, and microbiota. But I think it's important to walk home with mitochondrial effects are not entirely metabolic. We're not prepared to say they are not metabolic, but they are not entirely metabolic because the mitochondria somehow signal to the nucleus and to other cells, bacteria in this case. So um, ultimately what I uh, hope you will agree with is that the mitochondrial DNA is one of many quantitative trait loci that alter the efficiency of metastasis, but they're not the only uh, driver in this case. So I'm going to come back. Early I asked about why is it there are differences in susceptibility or metastasis and show you one or two uh, real quick experiments to address this other issue. Why is it two patients can have such different responses to therapy um, when they otherwise look identical? And this, uh, again, uses a, a logic scheme that the major mechanism of killing of cancer cells by radiation is due to the generation of reactive oxygen species. And most reactive oxygen species are found in the mitochondrion. So uh, we ask whether the polymorphisms in the mitochondria might alter radiosensitivity of mice. And we collaborated with Subrajit Saha uh, on this project, but this, the data I'm showing you here at the top replicate experiments were, that were done in the late 1950s when radiation therapy was beginning to be recognized as a potential uh, cancer therapeutic. Here, uh, three different strains of mice, C, uh, FVB, C57, and BALB-C are irradiated with a dose of whole body irradiation that will kill the mice due to gut or GI related toxicities. 
Subraja and I decided that um, since most of the uh, ROS are from mitochondria, that this differential could be due to uh, a differential, uh, could lead to a differential survival. So we took FVB, BALP-C, uh, and, and C57, but then um, we also took the minx mice, and interestingly, with the BALP-C mitochondria, the, the Kaplan-Meier curve is shifted almost over to the wild type valve C and the C57 uh, mitochondria shift the curve, but not quite as far. So the pattern is still there. Um, and of course it makes sense that the nuclear genome would be uh, a contributor as well. Um, we had to make another mouse with the C57 nucleus and FVB mitochondrion. The experiments are underway to address the converse experiment. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that data to share with you today. But uh, Subraja um, did a, a little a more detailed analysis because uh, the differential responses here are due to gut stem cells, intestinal stem cell pools. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with this kind of thing, I'm just going to quickly talk to it. Um, it turns out that the intestinal stem cell functionality is regulated uh, by the mitochondrial genome, uh, where FVB mitochondria, the, the stem cells are not nearly as robust, or, or more robust than the valve C. All right, so I promised I'd uh, try and pull this towards an end. Um, We've, I've shown you those phenotypes. Now we want to figure out how this is working. And uh, what are the signals that go from the mitochondria to the nucleus or mitochondria to bacteria and vice versa? Um, and I'm going to warn you that this is almost all speculation. I'll show you some very preliminary data, but um, hopefully it gets you excited and perhaps collaborations can occur. But um, the key rationale here is that every phenotype we've looked at involves a lot of different genes. And the selectivity appears to be uh, a critical um, parameter that we need to address. And if we were looking at metabolic changes like um, acetate groups or methyl groups, the pools would lead to a rising or a falling in the epigenetic marks or gene expression. Um, and the selectivity would not be visualized in that way. So we began to uh, think that it could be some sequence specificity in the nucleotides themselves, that is the polymorphisms, that could be rendering this. And since the majority of genes in mitochondrial DNA are from tRNAs, we began to look at the 50 shades of RNA. Um, you know, uh, when I was a grad student, we talked about messenger RNA, tRNAs, and ribosomal RNAs. And now uh, these, all of these can lead to um, different non-coding um, RNAs, um, small non-coding RNAs, long, long, and so on. But I'm gonna focus on tRNAs here um, because uh, again, they're the most predominant. And in fact, we found only one polymorphism in all the strains of mice that we've used. And these occur in the mitochondrial tRNA encoding for arginine tRNA. And the details of these polymorphisms are not critical at this point, just know that they exist within the tRNA. And, um, but, you know, the, the thought of this is that tRNA are merely shuttles for amino acids in, in protein translation. But in fact, over the last decade, tRNAs are shown to be uh, fragmented into very distinct fragments that are non-random. And uh, these tRNA fragments, or TRFs, um, have biological functions. Here is just a quick summary of many of those biological functions. The ones with the red dots are some that we've already looked at. And uh, the, the regulation 
um, has been extended into cancer phenotypes. And you'll notice uh, the, the recent data. Um, the, the, these are the, the data, but showing that the polymorphisms in these TRFs could in fact be relevant. And Adam Shai has recently cloned two tRNA fragments from uh, mitochondrial tRNA um, for arginine. And we are actively studying um, the long uh, M MTTRF, this is uh, uh, tRNA for, uh, for uh, arginine, he calls it the long form or RL3 and uh, intermediate form uh, RI. And um, we show that these are expressed in human cancers. They're differentially expressed in the minx mice, and they're differentially expressed in mouse tissues. And with our collaborator, Isidore Ragutsis, uh, we uh, now have uh, preliminary data that these uh, TRFs may be relevant um, for these kinds of functions. So where are we going from here? We're gonna quantify these, uh, these tRNA fragments um, using methods that we have to develop because these are not well studied. Um, you can't just do uh, PCR, um, RT-PCR, because we're looking at internal fragments. So we have to put linkers on either end um, and do that. Northern blotting is a bit too cumbersome for a lot of this. We have experiments underway to look at how they're generated what they're interacting with, how they're characterized biochemically. And we're going, uh, actually I have a high school student who's studying um, whether these tRNA fragments, synthetic ones can affect microbiome, um, radio sensitivity and so on. But um, coming back to Dr. Das's uh, introduction, uh, we believe that because mitochondria are, um, associated with race and ancestry, they may explain in a genetic way how cancer uh, racial disparities exist in terms of development of disease, um, responses to therapy, um, uh, and, and so on, and how mitochondria contribute uh, to uh, this racial disparity. So with that, um, I end with this quote from Enrico Fermi to Robert Oppenheimer, um, that before you heard my lecture, you may have been confused. Hopefully now you're confused on a much higher level. Um, uh, with that, I thank you, and we'll try and answer questions if there's any time left. Thank you so much for the invitation. I've enjoyed uh, the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for sharing uh, such uh, in-depth uh, data on uh, cancer metastasis, mitochondrial regulations, tumor microenvironment, and uh, crosstalk between microbiome and mitochondria. We have here Dr. Selva Murthy, sir, in this panel, is a president of Amity Science and Innovation and Foundation and is also Chancellor of Amity University, Chhattisgarh. So sir, welcome in this, uh, uh, we welcome you in this uh, webinar group. And sir, we would like to hear from you on this. Uh, thank you, uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you, Dr. Dhruv. I was listening to you, Professor uh, Danny Welch, right from the beginning, I was listening to your wonderful work that you have done. This has really brought in a new dimension in terms of the polymorphism of genes in uh, mitochondria and the energy levels which you can provide to modulate the progression of the disease cancer. Uh, I just wanted to know one thing, what is the clinical application of this uh, research where you have demonstrated the polymorphism in mitochondria? How do we use it in terms of regulating the energy level of the cancer cell or switching off the energy and then making the cancer cell die? So is it possible to think in those directions? And if so, what are the advances you are making in therapeutic application of this basic knowledge of uh, genome polymorphism? 
Over to you. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Um, I think uh, initially uh, we can, uh, we're, we're looking at deep sequencing mitochondria um, from a blood drop, since this is a germline kind of effect, we may be able to use this, uh, the clinicians may be able to use that information to um, stratify patients. Who is at very high risk? Who is at lower risk for developing metastasis? Or who is likely to be responsive to radiation? Who is not? So that's the, I believe that'll be the first step. Right. The, the second um, level um, really requires us to understand these tRNA fragments, um, presuming they're correct. Mm -hmm. tRNA fragments are actually very stable in plasma, and so they could be developed into therapeutics because they are taken up by cells. So <clears throat> speculating, um, so as long as you recognize I'm speculating, um, uh, it's very possible that um, we could give a tRNA fragment that makes the metastases less likely to develop and we could hold cells in dormancy. Obviously we're at the really earliest stages, but I, that's the vision that I see. Would you also like to comment on the glycolytic pathways? You know, when you look at uh, the cancer cell, which are hungry for energy, and they go into anaerobic metabolism and the glycolytic pathways are stimulated. So is it possible to use things like true deoxydeglucose for uh, the, uh, this particular thing to give uh, the, in the cell, cancer cell, switching up the energy because it cannot provide the energy. It will enter, enter the cell. So uh, can you just yeah. comment on those type of research? Because this was similar thing was done at... Uh, Institute of Nuclear Medicine and Allied Sciences. Before radiotherapy, you load the patient with uh, uh, the two deoxydeglucose. So the yes. cancer cell takes the normal glucose as well as this two deoxy analog glucose, and then it cannot give the energy. So you can just easily kill this weaker cell. So uh, can you think in this mitochondrial dimension, can you look at this glycolytic pathways modulation by using the genes which are responsible in mitochondria. Um, now your, your point is very well taken and 100% appropriate. Um, it, the, the whole idea of the metabolic changes, um, I think was really popularized back almost a century ago. Um, Otto Warburg uh, proposed this and 2-deoxyglucose has been used. Um, my suspicion um, or my, my bias, uh, I will be more honest with that. My bias is that um, the metabolic pathways are gonna be a little less relevant because the cancer cells can adapt by switching between oxidative phosphorylation and glycolysis. They're never exclusively one or the other. And the 2-deoxyglucose blocks more the um, glycolytic pathway. And so the cells tended to shift or compensate. Um, that being said, the, there are mutations in the electron transport pathway. Uh, most of those that I showed tend to be in complex one of electron transport. And so that would shift towards glycolysis. So knowing the information there, may again give information uh, that the type of information to say this patient is likely not to be able to compensate in the oxfos pathway they could <clears throat> use glycolysis therefore 2dg might be more effective uh, and and i admit that now you have stretched my abilities i like most students um i confess I memorized those pathways and forgot them right after the exam. Uh, and uh, so it's, it's not a comfort level for me <laughs> to talk about those pathways, but I think I've been accurate with the things I've said so far. <laughs> Dr. Das, 
how do we connect with him? You have brilliant uh, cancer yeah. biologists and yeah. he, Dr. Yes, Dr. We, are, we are talking about it. And uh, before the meeting started, we have uh, quite some time, almost 10, 15 minutes we have discussed. And uh, as we have a next meeting of the Cancer Association, we have already invited him to come next year at this time to MIT. We right. are doing the Cancer Association meeting next year which is postponed from this year to do it physical. But before that, we will have some collaboration certainly because there are two, three, rather the alumni from the KUMC, Cancer's Medical Center, where he is the director of the Cancer Center of the Department of uh, Cancer Biology. So Professor um, Chandadeep Tandan and Professor Simran Tandan and Dr. Dhruv is all uh, alumni of the KUMC where <laughs> Professor Wells is there. So I think there would be, we will certainly build up the relations and I have my <coughs> junior there, um, uh, Professor Banerjee, um, uh, and he knows him because they are of the same department. So um, I have visited that KUMC Cancer Center. I have delivered lecture also. So suddenly we will build up a relation that way MIT does from all level, student exchange and uh, research collaborations, we look forward. And uh, he has contributed immensely. So he is a person of the metastatic metastasis. Absolutely. And he has worked with the area, our area, the breast cancer and other cancers also, but uh, um, uh, the including the triple the breast cancer, he was commenting on because we have the breast cancer TNVCs, which are most prevalent in the pre stages, which is uh, just contrast to the US, which is post -monopersal. So it is a different um, uh, situation here and very alarming situation because the young ladies are getting in their prime time of their life, they are getting the cancer. And that is as high as 74% prevalent. So it is it's, it's a very alarming. We do not know, but the hospitals knows how the patient influx coming and all. So yeah. this is a very, mm, so suddenly we look forward for right, right. building up. Professor Welsh uh, actually founder president, Dr. Ashok Chauhan, <clears throat> has uh, launched a big mission, Mission Synergy, Mission Connect and Mission Synergy. That is, we have to connect with people. Once we work together, we can do things faster, better. So that is the philosophy with which the mission synergy has been uh, launched from Amiti by founder president, Dr. Shok Chauhan. So in that, uh, we would like to permanently connect with you for a very long time to come with you, your institutions, and so that we can do many things together, joint PhD program. So you, ca you can mentor a PhD scholar together because we have uh, more than about two dozens of uh, the very senior peer faculties accomplished uh, successful faculties with him in cancer biology. Different fields, different fields of, different types of cancer, mm -hmm. breast, cervix, and uh, oral cancer, head and neck cancer, renal cancer, liver cancer, everything you mentioned, pancreatic cancer he has. So I think it will be a great thing to, your institution has done a lot of outstanding contributions in cancer. So we, re we really would like to build a very strong partnership with you, Professor Welsh. Well, it, is it will be interest for him, great interest, because this ethnicity is different. Our, the carcinogenesis process may be different. As I said about this breast cancer, similarly, so we didn't have the colon cancer. Our food habit is a little different, but it is coming up very high colon cancer, including prostate cancer. So, which was the US problem, but it is now it has become a, a Indian problem and it is growing up. So this is a good time to study how it is increasing the incidence of these cancers. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. Dr. Dhruv, uh, you being the coordinator for this cancer research cluster. Yes, sir. Under the yes, guidance sir. of Professor Das. Yes, now sir. We, we will also connect with him in, the, in our cluster. Yes, sir. <laughs> Yes, uh, yes. I think it will be great that if you can involve him and uh, sure, that will be a sure, great sir. benefit to all the members yeah. of the cluster. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it will be a big benefit to all of us. Yeah, Professor Welsh, you wanted to say something. Sorry. 
Oh, I was going to say um, our philosophy at KU is uh, that we will collaborate with anybody because no one can, people can make progress on their own, but it is very slow. Um, as you said, um, it is uh, collaboration uh, that leads to synergy. Absolutely. Yes. So. Dr. Tendon, would you like to? Uh, sure, sure. Uh, I'm audible to all? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, at the outset, Professor Wells, a very interesting talk. And uh, being an alumnus of uh, KU, I myself, as I told you, I was also in Walla East, Bob Delisle's lab, uh, in two, from 2000 to 2003, almost. Uh, well, I have two small, uh, I won't call them questions, but my, out of my curiosity, I would like to ask you. Uh, it has been often observed that surgical removal of tumor can trigger tumor recurrence and also metastasis. What is your take on it? This is my first small query. Another one is slightly different, but I would like to know out of curiosity. There is a similarity between mitochondria and bacteria. They say that mitochondria perhaps originated from bacteria many years back. So do you think that bacteria will also have some role in this? Over to you. Um, <laughs> Um, both good questions. Um, with regard to the surgical removal and the impact on metastasis, um, I think some of the cleanest data that I am aware of comes from Judah Folkman, who showed that um, there are factors made by the primary tumor that um, actually keep distant cells in check and when we remove them surgically, uh, we remove inhibitors of angiogenesis um, as, as one mechanism. Uh, and, but I believe there are some other things that are going on there because uh, I think some recent data that I've uh, heard uh, indicate that uh, removing the primary tumor also might alter uh, communications with uh, immune cells. So the, the, the immune system is responding differently. Um, your question about the bacteria, uh, again, this does not come from our work, but I, I, I'm trying to integrate it. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the person uh, in France who's been doing, I think, some of the nicest work. It will come to me, but um, she has uh, been showing that, um, the, the, that um, the bacterial, the microbiome, um, they are doing uh, fecal transplants into patients and those are impacting uh, survival and response to therapy and the like. So uh, that's not mitochondrially related, but it's bacterially related. I, um, what will happen with time, because we have done a little bit of this um, in an experimental system, we've put some of our mice with foster mothers because we know that most of the bacteria in the microbiome are transmitted via the mother, the, the milk. And uh, so those transplants of, in people will likely be impacted because uh, well, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. So when we had these foster mothers, we showed that initially the microbiome related to the mother more than the genetic ancestry. But over time, the microbiome shifted towards what the genetics said they should be. So it's going to be more complicated than just doing one or the other. Uh, but I, I think the fields are too young or new to, to answer your question without hand-waving, which is what I just did. And thank you for smiling when I said that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Professor Welch. In fact, you know, talking to you, uh, I'm feeling very nostalgic <laughs> about my, the time which I spent in KUMC many years back. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, we, ha uh, we have another... KU alumni, uh, Dr. Simran Tindan. Ma'am, are you there? 
She's on mute. Yes, I'm coming. Ma'am. Yes. Um, Dr. Welch, uh, it was, I mean, uh, your entire lecture has opened up. She works on breast cancer. Yes. As, uh, has actually yeah, changed um, our uh, understanding. I mean, the importance of mitochondria in the tumorogenesis process is has been really highlighted by you. And considering the role of mitochondria, whether it is in metastasis, the, uh, the tumor, and the microenvironment crosstalk, every, each and every aspect of the hallmarks that we have studied for cancer, I think the mitochondria is playing some role or the other. <clears throat> Although at this point in time, everything might not be so clear. But uh, one uh, point which you had brought up, uh, which was very interesting was that if the uh, reactive oxygen species are decreased, there is a decrease in the rate of metastasis. Uh, in one of your slides, you had mentioned uh, something like that. So my question is, um, you know, uh, whether certain phytochemicals which could stop the generation of excessive free radicals would in the long run, uh, you know, uh, act as some kind of a preventive measure against uh, metastasis. Uh, I think that is uh, definitely worth uh, asking, um, I will. I'm, I'm going to give uh, a couple of thoughts, and uh, you, you are at the borders of my knowledge base. So um, you feel free to correct me if I'm incorrect. But um, a lot of uh, very nice data shows that, um, um, like vitamin C, vitamin E. Mm -hmm. Things that scavenge radicals um, can be helpful in prevention. Um, I think uh, that indicates that dietary components, phytochemicals and the like, could be very useful. Um, what I don't think we've done is made any good connection with the mitochondrial mm -hmm. side of that. But um, if I were, if I had um, some students who were interested in my phone never rings unless I'm on a call. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, I, uh, if I had students who were interested in dietary components and the like, I think we could design experiments to actually address in cells. Sorry. Um, we could address whether cells that have the different mitochondria respond differently to, to different phytochemicals. Uh, so I think there are ways to do that. And I think experiments could be designed to address that. It's not an area I've thought about a great deal, but it's, it's obviously an important area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wells. Uh, I have some before it opens to the other audience. Hello. Yes. Hi there. Yes, sir. Um, I have some uh, uh, one query. Just I uh, wanted to know your comments. You just showed the slide, and the, the last that you said that mitochondrial DNA polymorphism or SNP. But it is I must appreciate your excellent talk before I come to the question and your talk, to my understanding, it has raised more questions than solution. So because it's uh, interesting, that is a good thing that it opens up a lot of thinking on the, uh, that you have presented. So that uh, creates a lot of thinking and it, it creates a lot of opportunity for doing research mm -hmm. in the different areas. So there are not complete answer many of the places. So one of the things that you said that mitochondrial DNA polymorphism or SNP can change the radio sensitivity, but you said then that it, 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 it increases the survival. That may be all right, but then when it's increased the radio sensitivity, then is that mitochondrial, mitochondrial polymorphism or SNP has any interaction with the ATP binding proteins or transporter proteins, which are like ABCG2, etc. cetera, that are produced by the cancer and cancer stem cells and which we are working on that, that leads to the radio resistance and that 
leads to the recurrence. So is there anything to do with these, this mitochondrial polymorphism to do with something with the, to suppress or um, uh, suppress this as an inhibitor like it works with the, against this ABCG tuporines? Excellent. Um, yeah. Now, for, first, um, I totally agree with you, uh, but my philosophy about research is we answer one question, but it usually helps predict a hundred others. So that's, <laughs> that's sort of, uh, that's where I come from. Um, I, I, I will just caution, you've said nothing that I disagree with, um, but our experiment was a very crude one where we were irradiating whole mice. Um, so we need to get to a more detailed cellular level and, and biochemical level. And we have not yet done that. Um, we, uh, there are experiments that I think I'd like us to be able to do um, I'm going to use a slightly different approach than what you described, but the idea is the same. We could look at cells um, that are identical except for BRCA1 mutations. So we have that entire uh, recombination pathway or double strand break repair pathways right. um, where we can look at those molecular mechanisms. Um, and unfortunately, dissecting it from the level of the contributions of the mitochondria may be a bit more challenging because um, the proteins that are encoded in the mitochondria do not leave the mitochondria for the most part, okay. unless the mitochondria is damaged. That's why I'm excited about these tRNA fragments because they can in fact alter protein complexes and change uh, shape of those complexes, which would, for example, if we were trying to get the uh, DNA helix into some kind of polymerase uh, complex, right. if, if it altered that uh, complex so that the polymerase is not, it would make more errors or not repair things, uh, it could very well be the case. Again, we haven't studied it. Uh, the field is just a little too new, but the direction you're thinking is one that I would like to be able to do. Okay. So. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Sir, I see a couple of questions from yeah, the you participants go ahead with the question. here. No. So with your permission, may I ask? May I go ahead? Or, or I, I, are you in the Q&A? Okay. So the first question is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, you, you went a little bit silent. So if it's okay, I can just read them um, and, and try and answer them live. Um, uh, Arvind Chabra, um, is there a possibility immune cell epigenome is also modulated by mitochondrial DNA? Uh, in the stromal epi epigenome? Um, that's a great question. And I, I, I think you're probably right, but we haven't measured it yet. Um, I, I believe that uh, uh, we will, in fact, see that um, take place. Um, see, uh, Ridayesh, I'm probably, apologies if I botched your name. Uh, uh, mitophagy influences hypoxia, include induced gene. Um, does this influence NRAMP, which may be involved in immune polarization? Um, yes, I, I, we, we looked briefly at um, mitophagy in our cells and did not see any measurable differences between the cells with different um, polymorphisms. That doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, we were looking at it in a population, so we may not have been able to do that. I will, I'm being very honest with you, I don't know enough about NRAMP and immune polarization to give you an answer, and I'd rather tell you I don't know than mislead you with a bad answer. So, um, what are the differences between tumor microenvironment between non-mitochondrial DNA transfers versus 
mitochondrial transfer cohorts. We actually did those measurements um, where, where we were looking at the, the, the minx mice uh, compared to their wild type control. Um, we actually just completed a study. Um, it was five year long back crossing uh, to look at uh, those mice and they were behaved exactly the same as the minx mice. So fortunately, we don't have to keep those uh, congenic back crosses anymore. Um, but uh, um, they, the, there are clear differences and they correlate with the mitochondria regardless of the mechanism we use to generate them. Um, how is mitochondria related to CKD and its various stages? I don't know what CKD is. Does anybody? Uh, I think it's probably CDK. CKD, CDK. Maybe it's CDK. It may be CDK only. Cyclo, um, CKD, uh, cytokeratin. Is that cytokeratin? Or and it's probably um, cyclin dependent kinases and not. Uh, uh, I don't think it'll be chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney disease? Uh, it could be chronic kidney disease. Chronic kidney yes, disease. Yes, Dr. Tendon can. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I was about to say that, but I don't know the role of this. So let uh, Dr. Welsh answer it. Um, well, um, we have a, uh, as, as many of you know, KU has a very strong polycystic kidney disease program. And we've started to do some studies with that group. Uh, to answer this question, it turns out the tissue with the highest expression of the poly, um, the uh, tRNA fragments uh, is, is kidney. So we're, we're interested in looking there. And the human cancer where we've seen this effect has also been in renal cell carcinoma. So we're looking at kidney, but um, not, not enough data at this point. Um, thank you for the very kind comment, uh, uh, Dr. Garatnwa. Um, Pankaj Sharma, excellent presentation of voluminous amount of data, particularly interested in the redox machinery driving ROS generation. Are these changes global or the specific redox related genes driving these changes? Um, most of the reactive oxygen species are thought to uh, be just a natural uh, byproduct of electron transport where you have electrons being moved around. Um, there is machinery. Um, most of it is encoded in the nucleus for scavenging um, uh, reactive oxygen species, um, manganese, superoxide dismutase, um, uh, copper zinc, uh, SOD, SOD is one and two. And I believe there's a third. Um, and interestingly enough, particularly SOD2, uh, is its loss is often associated with development of many cancers. So it does appear to be a modifier. Um, so that it's been looked at, but again, I haven't, I don't know that in enough detail. Um, what is does the aberrant apoptotic profile and metastasis correlate with mitochondrial polymorphisms? Ah, I didn't even mention this. Thank you for bringing it up. Uh, we actually measured the apoptosis in the various cells, both normal cells as well as uh, in the cancer cells, and we found no difference in apoptosis uh, at all um, in the minx mice. So it's not just inherent apoptosis susceptibility. Um, there may be some induction, but uh, we didn't get into that. Intercellular content of dying tumor cells may promote mitochondrial contamination. Uh, yes, um, your, your point is well taken that uh, is, uh, you could have contamination of the mito with mitochondria that influence metastasis. Uh, a group from New Zealand has been looking at this in great detail for taking up of mitochondrial DNA by um, both stromal cells as well as tumor cells. Um, we have always uh, maintained our colonies uh, in, a, in a way to reduce any uh, heteroplasmy. So we're, we are not observing any take up 
of the mitochondrial DNA by other cells. So in regard to the trans, uh, um, contamination, we don't think that's the case, but we haven't ruled it out 100%. Um, do you think we can target serine metabolism in cancers? Uh, short answer, probably, but I wouldn't know how. <laughs> Sorry, that's, it's a cop out of an answer, but it's the only one I can give with honesty. Um, exosomes and the minx mice, um, that's something we want to look at. Um, uh, many of these tRNA fragments are found in exosomes. Uh, so we have one experiment where we found tRNAs in exosomes, but we have not looked at it in any detail. So, and oh, I just got a hello from a former postdoc, Sitaram. Um, he says hello to me. So I'm looking forward to catching up with you, Sitaram. <laughs> uh, thank you for the nice talk. Thank you. Uh, microbiome and cell behavior like mitochondria is similar to bacteria or viruses like prefabricated nanoparticles. Uh, Oh, that's an interesting idea that the, the microbiome may make a, a nanoparticle of sorts, or the mitochondria may make a nanoparticle. Um, that relates a little bit to those exosomes. Um, and that's a, perhaps a mechanism by which we can communicate between these organelles and the cells. Um, so, uh, the scavenging uh, of superoxide dismutase play a role of the antioxidant molecules. Um, that's, a, again, a great question. That's the essence of how that Mito Tempo experiment is done that I reported on. Um, and uh, it obviously is a single experiment with a drug, but um, the, the mechanism is essentially the same. Um, mitochondria contributing to different aggressiveness uh, there have been one or two papers in the past year or two that have shown um, some associations with tumor progression, but uh, even the people who've done the experiments realize they are kind of sloppy um, and the controls have to be done. We have to have a lot more patient data to do that. And the last question in the Q&A box we see cancer cells undergo several transitions like EMT. How relevant is mitochondrial DNA to processes like this? Uh, excellent question. Um, the short answer is I don't know, other than during the epithelium mesenchymal transition, there does tend to be a, um, a reactive burst of energy development. So uh, the, it's correlation at this point only, uh, nobody's really looked in great detail. So my position is the EMT is not required. Um, and I think there's plenty of data to support that, but it is clearly one of the key mechanisms um, involved. Uh, we would have to be able to segregate those out. So I ran through those quickly. Apologize if I short circuited them, but tried to answer. Uh, so before we move for the vote of thanks, uh, may I request all the panel members if uh, they are having any questions, any suggestions, any point, any views to share here before we go for the vote of thanks. All the panel members, Dr. Silva Muthi, sir, Dr. Bisida, sir. Sir, you are muted. Yes, I am fine with that. It's fine. It's excellent. Okay. So, uh, Welsh, you have so many of your alumni here with MIT. <laughs> and I see postdocs and also people who have spent so many years with you. So it is, it is uh, all the more justification that we must build very, very strong partnership between MIT group as well as your uh, institution. So we would be keenly looking forward to deepening our relationship with you, expanding our cooperation. And we also many, many domains, a joint collaboration, <clears throat> research collaboration, joint PhDs, 
and internship for students. And also we like to have your students coming over here because we have a big group. So mobility both ways. So we would like to see more people coming from your institution and working with us for short term. And, going. and then we also have in US a big campus. We have a, a in the Long Islands of New York, we have acquired mm -hmm. a huge 175 acres of land with built-in complexes, which we are now transforming them into laboratories. So founder president Dr. Chauhan and uh, chancellor there, Dr. Asim Chauhan, have started a group which is known as Amiti Global Research Hub. So we want to create that as the hub and in which cancer will be a very important area of research there. So I think it will be cancers, your KU and our AU can establish a joint center there in our Long Island's New York campus. So that would be, then it's easy for our mobility also. So we, our people can come from here, stay there and then go to your place, work there. So that, that kind of uh, mobility can also be thought of. And uh, you, we are also trying to create some bioinformatics facilities to start with initially there. So related to cancer, we can actually look at cancer biomarker. Drug and, discovery and drug design. Uh, dr drug discovery is another domain in which we want to establish. I think the plenty of opportunity, Professor Welch, and we are uh, extremely grateful to you that you accepted our request. And uh, thank you very much. We look forward to meeting you more often. And perhaps next time when it opens up, come soon to our campus here in Noida and meet all our brilliant people, your, your former colleagues and uh, postdocs here in Amity Group. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I appreciate the invitation and uh, the great questions and the interactions that we've had this morning. And as soon as we can all travel again, yes. we must yes. find a way and <laughs> place that we can actually meet together. This is good, but it's not as good as being in the same room. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> we look forward that things normalizes by next year, this year. You should also, also visit, you know, you should also visit uh, Tendon, Simran, Drew, you people should visit Kansas again. Mm -hmm. Renew your the nostalgic experience of being there. Absolutely, we shall be looking forward to do that, sir. And once again, Professor Wells, and a very interesting talk. And looking forward to hear from you. You know, many more times, whether you come here or whether we go there. <laughs> well, well, hopefully, we can do both. Yeah. <laughs> well said. You, you, now you can conclude, huh? Uh, so uh, now may I request Professor Simritan and ma'am to give a word of thanks. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, as an alumna of Kansas University Medical Center, it is my proud privilege to give today's vote of thanks. I express my sincere thanks to Honorable Founder President, sir, Honorable Chancellor, sir, Honorable VC, ma'am, and Dr. Selva Murthy, who have initiated this cancer biology cluster to put all the scientists working in the area of cancer biology of Amity University under a single roof. On behalf of the Cancer Biology Cluster and Amity University, I would like to express my sincere thanks to today's speaker, Professor Danny Welch. I would also like to express my heartfelt gratitude to all the panelists present here, Dr. Selva Murthy, Professor B.C. Das, Professor Chandadeep Tandon, and the coordinator, Dr. Dhruv Kumar, and all the participants who have spared their valuable time and listened to such an interesting lecture delivered by Professor Danny Welsh. I would also like to thank the IT team for all their help and support. Thank you so much. <laughs>